Hello and welcome to GradCast, the official radio show and podcast of the Society of Graduate Students at Western University. I'm your host, Gregory Robinson. And I'm your co-host, Yusuf. And today we are here with Heather Stewart from my department, <laughs> philosophy department. She's doing a PhD in philosophy. Uh, welcome, Heather. Hi, thanks for having me. Cool. Um, so uh, tell us more about yourself and how you came to be interested in, say, philosophy and more specifically about the harmful speech acts, um, including microaggressions? I love this question. Probably like most people that came to philosophy, uh, the honest answer is by total accident. Now, um, <laughs> when I went to university, I was the first person in my family uh, to attend college. So naturally I went with like one of two possible career paths in mind, right? So I went yeah, to yeah. Uh, university thinking I would be um, a doctor of, of the medical sort, right? Um, and then I stumbled into a philosophy class. Um, it was philosophy uh, through literature and film. And Stumbled into? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I took a class in philosophy of literature and film and was pretty hooked. And that professor um, knew my interest in medicine and recommended that I take a medical ethics course. Um, and I really found the questions there about how do we design um, just healthcare systems? How do we make relationships between doctors and their patients more ethical? How do we account for certain sorts of vulnerabilities that might arise? Um, how do we improve on health disparities? And I became really interested in those questions more than I was interested in wanting to actually provide medical care to patients. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah, so here we are. I went thinking I would become a doctor and I'm kind of doing <laughs> that, but, but not the kind I thought I'd be. <laughs> yeah, doctor of philosophy, I, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. PhDs actually came before MDs. So it's really the original, the OG doctor, by the way. The OG doctor, I love yeah. that. <laughs> so you, you've already done your master's, I'm assuming. Yeah, um, I did my master's at the University of Colorado, um, Boulder. Cool. Yeah. And it was on, I'm assuming, bioethics related yeah. to that area? Yeah, I started a master's in bioethics in Louisville and then transferred um, to do philosophy more generally at Boulder. Um, and I worked okay. with Allison Jagger there, so I started doing more political philosophy um, while I was there. So how do you go from Colorado all the way over to Ontario and go to UWO? That seems like a big change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good question. One that I'm still regretting because I hate the cold and I hate the snow. And I started in Kentucky and and moved to Boulder and then moved to somewhere with even more snow. So I'm still uh, not sure how or <laughs> why I way. came upon that decision. But uh, postdoc in like Miami. Yeah, no kidding. I need to <laughs> seriously reevaluate. Um, I, I'm entertaining the thought of doing a postdoc or somewhere I would like to do a postdoc, and it's also somewhere cold and snowy. So. Um, <laughs> Maybe this is a good reminder to reevaluate. <laughs> what you got here, and I'm assuming you like it here at Western, though, even though it's a little cold. My supervisor is excellent. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm in good hands at Western for sure, despite the snow, and that I still don't know how to drive in the snow after three years. <laughs> no, I think a lot it of helps Canadians a lot. are like that, so it's okay. Is there, <laughs> um, so what I'm kind of curious about is that your research is about microaggression. And I'm, I gotta admit, I'm not somebody in philosophy. I've never actually even done a philosophy course, but I am very intrigued by it. I'm just wondering, is microaggression a well-studied area? Yeah, so um, not really within the context of philosophy. Um, the, con the concept itself started in um, psychology. It was coined in the 1970s by a black psychologist named Chester Pierce, but um, really, people started to pay attention to it in 2010 with the publication of a book called Microaggressions in Everyday Life um, by Dural Wing Su. And yeah, so there's a lot of empirical study of microaggressions and their effects um, on different and their sort of psychological impacts, their effects on stress, their effects on how comfortable people feel in their environments and things like that. But there hasn't been a lot of good conceptual work and the sort of work that philosophers do um, until very recently. So um, it's been roughly the last five or so years that you're seeing um, publications in major philosophy journals. And the first book on the philosophy of microaggressions just came out um, a couple months ago. So it's um, fairly recent that philosophers are starting to pay attention to microaggressions and their sort of moral and political consequences. So I don't think, I don't I've, think. I don't think I've mentioned this before to you, Heather, but 
um, my own introduction to microaggressions was from reading your, your work, actually, and I actually was um, really fascinated by one of the talks that you gave in the department, and that led me to look at some of your papers on this uh, speech act, uh, sort of harmful speech act phenomena, uh, such as hate speech or microaggressions or slurs, be them gender-based or uh, racial-based. Um, and it's really fascinated me. Uh, could you tell us more about how um, some other resources that people who may not be so familiar with microaggressions and their harms that they, can, if they want to start to know more about, would be it would be a great introdu introduction for them. Because I definitely yeah. need it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so the the book that I was just mentioning, um, which is the first. Um, book and philosophy on microaggressions. It's an edited collection. It's edited by Lauren Freeman and Janine Weekshore um, on Rutledge Press, I think. Yeah, I have a chapter yeah. in the book and I don't know off the top of my head, which is uh, perhaps horrible. But yeah, so that's an anthology. It has a lot of great work. There's a lot of great people. Um, and there's some great conceptual work happening there in terms of people trying to figure out like what really are the boundaries of this concept. Um, and there's, of course, some really good moral and political work there, people thinking through questions of uh, what do microaggressions actually do in the world? How, what harmful effects, if any, do they have on people? What political consequences do they have? Um, it's the latter that I'm particularly interested in. So yeah, I think that would be a really good resource if people want a good collection with sort of all of their uh, philosophy of language and moral philosophy and political philosophy all in one place. So if I were to ask you, how would you define microaggressions? Yeah, so I, like most people currently working on microaggressions, kind of borrow a definition from Dorald Su um, and his colleagues, and he defines microaggression as brief and commonplace um, verbal or behavioral indignities. They can be either uh, implicit or explicit, and they're rooted in some sort of um, prejudice or stereotype about somebody on the right. basis of a marginalized identity. And again, this can be race, gender, disability status, and so on. Um, so kind of the go-to example is um, a person of color is, is in your class and you ask them where they're from and they're like, Ontario, Canada. And you're like, no, where are you really from, right? And this sends the message that somebody that looks like them can't just be from London, Ontario, right? Um, and it sends the message that they're, they're not taken to really belong or be authentic in that space. So that's one sort of popular example that people give. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So what, what in particular are you looking at in microaggression in that general area? Yeah. Um, so I do kind of a few different things. What my dissertation is working on is trying to um, have a comprehensive response to what I call the sticks and stones objection. And um, to be sure, this isn't like a... What is the sticks and stones objection? That's my first question for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's go that, that road. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it isn't like, uh, I'm not pointing at one particular objection, but I'm kind of clustering them together. And I think the spirit of the objections <laughs> is that, right, um, words aren't like physical violence. They can't really hurt you, right? So we've all heard the sort of childhood refrain, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me, right? And so... Wow there's this kind of line of thought that a number of um, academics often writing in popular venues are raising that microaggressions aren't really harmful, people are just sort of overly sensitive, they could just get thicker skin, uh, this is part of an overblown sort of victimhood culture where everybody's like looking to be um, oppressed, everybody's just too sensitive, um, snowflakes if you will, right, we've all heard these things. Um, so that's the kind of broadly speaking, sticks and stones objection that I try to respond to. So, so you know what, I actually Googled sticks and stones because I was trying to remember what the phrase was. And I, I somehow mm -hmm. thought that the phrase might have been suggesting that words can do more harm. And then I saw the actual phrase, I'm like, what? Really, is that the saying that, I thought words can really do a lot more harm sometimes. And it was strange for me to actually find that childhood saying. I guess my question for you is when you say that some words, um, some types of speech phenomena such as hate speech can cause remarkable harm and or, or 
uh, slurs and microaggressions as well can cause the same sort of harms as well for minorities. Um, the sticks and stones objection is for people who say, well, the words don't cause any harm at all. And that's a problem. But what about those people who would say, look, Heather, I agree with you. Uh, hate speech causes harm. I'm on board. And so does slurs. And we should have consequences for that. We should be accounted, uh, accountable as well. But when it comes to microaggressions, I'm not sold. Um, so they agree with the, the idea of words causing harm, but perhaps they're not sold on the idea of microaggressions. What would you say to this sort of a person? And how can you create that sort of awareness for people that these um, aggressions over time have these cumulative effects that can cause remarkable harm? Yeah. So. Um, I think the like most easy answer for for me giving that giving my like Facebook comment response to someone would be well the empirical literature just demonstrates that these things are in fact harmful um, but then of course there are going to be people who deny that the empirical literature is good or like or something like that um, right. so kind of taking off my uh, taking off the easy hat and putting on the philosopher one the first thing I would highlight is that most of the people making these sorts of objections, at least in print. Um, the sorts of people that I'm talking about when I talk about the sticks and stones objection, um, they are mostly writing from socially dominant positions. So um, mm -hmm. perhaps I don't want to call people uh, by name in this setting, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, they're publishing on these things. So uh, to name a few, right? Jonathan Haidt, Greg Lukenhoff, Jason Campbell, Bradley Manning, all these folks, uh, they are notably white men of economic privilege at elite institutions in most cases. And so um, one thing I think is important to keep in mind when you're reading those sorts of critiques um, and people are saying microaggressions don't occur is who is making that claim that microaggressions don't occur and whose voices oh, yeah. should we be listening to on that question. So my work is guided by um, a trend in epistemology called fem feminist standpoint epistemology and Basically what that holds is that when you're theorizing about conditions of oppression or things that marginalized people experience, you should always start from the perspective of those most likely to be on the receiving end or those most likely to be. Uh, so if we're looking at current events right now, who are we going to ask about what racism is like or what what structural and systemic racism is like, what police brutality is like, and whose testimony really counts when we're trying to address those questions. Right. So when it comes to microaggressions, I think we need to be centering those most likely to be on the receiving end, right? So in the case of microaggressions, that is going to be members of structurally uh, marginalized groups. And so that's the sort of non-empirical answer is maybe we listen to the testimony of those on the receiving end and what do they have to say about what they experience, right? I guess that's why we have these listening sessions as well at Western mm -hmm. in terms of having the anti-racism workshop one of the tasks was to have these listening sessions and then come up with suggestions and proposal that, proposals that they can follow through. So that's really fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, of course. As somebody not in philosophy, it kind of just, it surprises me because like I don't always think about like this sort of, I don't really think in that sort of way, but it's like so much in the past, that's what we've done, but it seems so obvious to just you know, if we're going to ask somebody like, oh, is there racism in Canada? You're not going to ask like a white person, you know, is there racism? Because they'd be like, oh, no, of course not. And they don't actually experience it. But historically, this is what we do, right? Like history yeah. is so often, right, told through the perspectives and the lenses of those in the most dominant positions, or it's always those who occupy sort of positions of political power who get to speak to things, right? So, um, it is just, in fact, often the case that who we're hearing from when it comes to how bad problems of racism are and things like that are the people in the most sort of prominent positions or the most powerful positions. And that that already seems kind of wrongheaded when we're trying to really see what's going on um, in marginalized communities. It's just it's so crazy for me to believe that, like, I, no, I believe it. But like, it's just it's crazy yeah, yeah. to think that it's like that's just the way that it's always been. Yeah. And it's not until recently that we're starting to actually question that. So I think this is a good transition into what's going on more recently and how your research can actually apply to say like Black Lives Matter or mm -hmm. recently the Me Too movement. Has your research actually looked at any of these particular areas and maybe even have like a publication or something in, in this general uh, area? Maybe even looking at like the indigenous people of Canada and that they've all 
been uh, stereotyped and uh, have been denied access to certain things. Yeah, that's that's really great. And I, I think you're right that um, there are so many sort of like uh, cultural and political movements right now that are causing us all to sort of reevaluate the way that we relate to each other, the way that we think about each other, the way that we talk to each other. So um, I think this, this sort of work um, has some sort of explanatory power in that regard. But um, yeah, I've, I've written on um, the Me Too movement and the way that we talk about um, victim survivor testimony um, in ways that are sort of inherently dismissive and, and things like that. But right now, I think, yeah, to bring it back to sort of what, what is or ought to be in focus right now with the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, we're seeing so much of these subtle sorts of, I don't know if you all are seeing this on your Facebooks, but um, the oh, tendency yeah. of somebody to comment Black Lives Matter to have somebody follow up with no all lives White matter. Lives. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and right, and so like thinking about these, these little comments that maybe, maybe lots of people are making them in bad faith, but maybe there are people who genuinely don't understand what's wrong with uttering that phrase and maybe they're well intended and at the very least maybe their intentions uh aren't to be explicitly racist or something like that i don't know that that's always the case but if we are to give people the benefit of the doubt right and just yeah. thinking about what that kind of phrase does that simple phrase right it it dismisses it denies it undermines it takes away the seriousness of the black lives matter movement and so i think yeah like thinking seriously about the way um we use language another example would be are we describing demonstrations and protests or are we describing riots and rioters right and just the subtle things that we do with language that really uh has an impact on how we view a situation how we view a movement how we view people in our communities i think we it's a really powerful opportunity for us to reflect um on that in this moment right um yeah that's an important question and i really like like the answer as well um, I guess oftentimes people do these things unintentionally and I really don't are so tone deaf to certain things it's quite unfortunate but I guess our task is still to um, educate and engage in a positive manner and hopefully they can also people can learn from each other a lot so hopefully that that improves the situation I guess um, what does Black Lives Matter mean to you uh, especially given the kind of uprising we're seeing uh, it knowing that you're doing research on microaggressions and trying to relate it to um, our speech and sort of maximizing speech in this sort of way by not having microaggressions probably. How, how do you feel about this situation? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I know exactly what you mean by how do I feel about. This I guess. Situation, but. Right. I mean, like, what what does Black Lives Matter mean for you? Uh, someone who's doing her research on microaggressions. Yeah, I think right now, um, so let me just start by affirming like as loudly as I can to the audience and everyone else that Black Lives Matter and that we have, and there's a moral imperative that we center um, Black lives, our Black students, our Black community members. And I think if we just like, like myself as a researcher um, who researches from the social position of whiteness, I have an obligation, right, to listen to what my friends of color tell me about their experiences um, to try to do better to be vulnerable to being called out when when i do make mistakes when i do commit a microaggression even from my position of my best intentions and my trying to uh to be a good friend a good accomplice a good colleague whatever it is and i so i think yeah i think we all have that responsibility to the extent that we are committed to things like racial justice to take a moment to step back to learn things to unlearn things probably more importantly to genuinely listen to hold ourselves accountable to hold those around us accountable right like the, it we're in a moment where we really have an opportunity to reckon with what sorts of practices and norms we think are acceptable what what things we think are unacceptable and this is going to happen in our institutional spaces right the the university is happening is currently having uh hopefully um a serious reckoning with with racism and with what sorts of, for example, speech practices are right. um, allowed or, or disallowed in, on the campus space. And so, yeah, from someone who thinks seriously about uh, permissible and impermissible language, I think this is a real opportunity um, 
that we can handle responsibly and take concrete actions on, or we can continue to sort of uh, be complicit and, and tone deaf and all those things that you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah. So now you mentioned that you were originally from Kentucky, but you've been to Colorado and now you're here in Canada. So I'm just wondering, have you noticed differences between these three places or do you see microaggressions everywhere? Yeah, so yeah. I, wit I witnessed microaggressions in all those places. Um, I've, al I've also witnessed uh, a sort of denial that they occur within the Canadian context. And, and I think, again, we're in a moment where there's a real opportunity to reckon with um, the reality of the way things are and to listen to the people who are on the receiving end of microaggressions and, and other sorts of harmful practices, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think all of these things are prominent whether you're in the south in Kentucky or in Colorado or here in Ontario. Um, and I think a real hurdle to overcome within the Canadian context is that idea that racism is a uniquely American problem and particularly that anti-black racism is a uniquely American problem. And uh -huh. I think if we listen to those in our community, they will tell us otherwise. Um, I was at the Black Lives Matter rally downtown and um, so many of our black community members were chanting or holding signs that said like do you believe us now right and so i think that tendency to say that the problem is elsewhere as a way to sort of exculpate one uh, from responsibility or from having to do the hard work of trying to evaluate yourself trying to learn trying to do better is just to say either that that doesn't happen here or at least it's not as bad as it is in america right um and i think that's sort of a cop out that if we are really committed to racial justice, uh, we'll, we'll try to avoid and resist. So Heather, something in your papers I read some time ago had an impact on me when it came to thinking about free speech. So I think you partly argued that, look, by, by having some limitations on free speech, um, we, we can, it doesn't mean that free speech is, has been restricted in some important way, but instead you can think of it as sort of enhancing free speech or expanding it by um, disallowing microaggressive language acts or something like that. We thereby allow minorities to vocalize and share their views in a way that we didn't hear before. And in that sense, expressiveness has enhanced. Could you share, uh, talk more about this point? Yeah, definitely. I think, um some of the criticisms of uh, the sorts of speech phenomena and regulating them or trying to minimize them um, is that, you know, this is a violation of people's free speech. Sometimes I think that's sort of disingenuous already. Um, what really is, uh, say, the use of a slur contributing to uh, either academically or otherwise to the context that you're in. But yeah, I think they're independent of that. I think they're are good reasons rooted in free speech itself um, to try to regulate harmful speech phen phenomena because I think that has the consequence of creating actually fairer or more just conditions for, for speech. And what I mean by that is that if we have, if we create conditions where it's okay to constantly degrade our classmates of color, our classmates that are women or queer students, then they aren't able to speak up in that context. So if we're thinking about a university classroom and there's just absolute free speech and anybody can say whatever they want. They can say, uh, women are stupid, illogical and bad at philosophy. Well, then maybe you've created a condition where I don't feel able or, or in, in fact, uh, I'm not able to speak in that environment. So I think to the extent that we take seriously the argument that these forms of speech can uh, degrade one's equal standing, can um, make them be less included or something like that, then controlling them in some way actually has an overall uh, sort of net benefit for free speech. So I just think thinking of these things as like a contrast between freedom of speech and equality is um, overly simplistic. Uh, right. And it's really, you might be curtailing um, some sorts of speech in the overall interest of uh, more equitable free speech or mm -hmm. conditions in which everyone is actually able to speak instead of the few people from sort of more dominant positions always already being able to speak freely. <laughs> so freedom of speech for everyone instead of just you know the more dominant uh, sort of uh, people cool yeah that, that's the hope and both that we create conditions where people um 
are able to or are empowered to speak up and also uh, perhaps more importantly that they're taken seriously uh, when they do so, right? That they're not automatically dismissed or viewed as just the angry black person or the complaining woman or whatever sort of our social tropes are that we exacerbate through microaggressions and slurs and things like that. So it's both creating opportunities for people to speak and creating conditions in which they're taken seriously when they do so. So if we were to witness, say, a microaggression, what would you say is the best way as a person or as a society to sort of combat that and to help change their behavior or help them realize um, something that like they, they are doing a microaggression? Yeah, I think we have to become, so there, there's like a, uh, there's like a maybe potentially unhelpful, um, just outright hostile version of this that isn't necessarily what I'm talking about. But I think we have to be more comfortable um, bringing these things to light to each other. Like um, I was in a meeting with the chair of my department earlier and she was mentioning that sometimes people just truly don't know. Um, of course, this isn't always the case. Sometimes people know and they continue to mess up. But sometimes we do people a service by saying, hey, this thing that you said is harmful either to me or or to these other people and sometimes just if people know that what they're doing is hurtful or harmful that might be reason for them to stop um, so I think we all have a responsibility instead of just like idly sitting by when we see things that we probably know are inappropriate um, or harmful right so if we're seeing our trans student be misgendered in the classroom not feeling like oh I'm afraid to sort of uh, rock the boat by saying something, actually saying something, so that either that person doesn't have to, or that so the person who um, made the microaggressive comment knows better. Um, and so I think we all have a sort of obligation to do that, and ideally to do it in a way that is calling people in and trying to help them grow, as opposed to uh, canceling them for the rest of time, which yeah. maybe has a place <laughs> for, for some <laughs> other things, but um, in the interest of really trying to, to grow and to make our communities more inclusive and more just, um, I think being willing to be called out ourselves and being willing to sort of support other people's growth is really important. Um, so yeah, sometimes just being able to tell people what they did or point it out to them goes a long way. One of the things that I really like that you mentioned earlier was that sometimes even, you know, yourself, you might make a microaggression and you want your peers and you want your friends to correct you. And I think that just goes to show that somebody that's doing their PhD in microaggressions can still make mistakes. And there is something you know, wrong with that and that you, know, you shouldn't be doing it, but at the same time, it's okay to make a mistake, just fix it and learn from it. And I think that as society is something that we have to do a better job at. And I think just emphasizing that even a PhD student recognizes that is pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, we all need that humility of part of the process of growing and learning is that you're going to mess up and being open to making mistakes and obviously trying your hardest not to make mistakes, but recognizing that when you do, um, even those people with the best intentions are going to mess up and you have to be willing to be called out or um, have it brought to your attention when you do. And I think that humility is really important. So we just have a minute left and I guess I wanted to, wanted to know uh, what's your um, maybe sort of ultimate goal that you hope to achieve from your dissertation and where do you think you'll go um, uh, afterwards once you're done with the dissertation what what else what other kinds of things would you want to engage with yeah so the sort of like theoretical that work that i do is is at its core really applied so the long-term hope is that um this sort of work can go some way towards actually making a difference, whether it's in our academic institutions or in our medical institutions, which I work on in uh, sort of a different context. So really hoping that this sort of work gives people the grounds to think more seriously about um, language is what maybe I would hope for the dissertation. Uh, for myself, uh, there's gonna be a job market in the fall, right? After yeah. COVID. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, in my sort of fairy tale uh, world, uh, COVID's over and the job market is fine and thriving and I get a tenure track job. Uh, I don't know. So yeah, the, the long-term goal is obviously that, um, but also to remain active in uh, sort of politics and community activism and the things that I'm sort of passionate about now. And yeah. Thank you very Thank much you for coming. Day. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, th thanks so Thank much. Very much. 
if, uh, if anybody wants to learn more about this or learn more about your research, is there a certain place that they can go to like social media or a website or something? Yeah, um, I do have a website. Um, I don't know uh, how fun it is. It's like a glorified CV, but it's www.heatherstewartphilosophy.com, I think. Um, I don't have Twitter or anything fun like that, but I'm also just Heather Stewart on Facebook and I'm probably the one that pops up that says I'm a PhD student at Western. So um, you can also yeah. contact me over there. And we can, we'll, uh, we'll add some links there so that you guys can uh, get access to her, uh, her website. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for coming on, Heather. This has been GradCast, the official radio show and podcast of Society of Graduate Students at Western University. I have been your host, Gregory Robinson. My co-host was... Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been talking to Heather. And this episode was also produced by Yusuf. If you'd like to be involved with the show or get in contact with us, email us at gradcastradio at gmail.com. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at gradcastradio. To listen to us, we're on the radio at CHRW 94.9. You can also find all of our episodes on our website at gradcast.ca or on our podcast apps like Podbean, iTunes, and Spotify. Alternatively, select podcasts like this one have been uploaded to YouTube at Gradcast Radio. Thank you for listening and have a great night.